Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Tinnitus TV. You know, sometimes it's true, two heads really are better than one, especially when they belong to Eddie Spaghetti of the Super Suckers and Frank Meyer of the Street Walking Cheetahs. These two musicians have been friends and occasional collaborators for years, but now they've taken it one step further by making an album together, the wonderfully named Motherfucking Rock and Roll. Naturally, there is plenty of that to be found on this disc, and that's no surprise given the music that these guys have been making individually for decades. What might surprise you, though, is how much love of 80s music you hear in some of these songs, especially in their cover of the Kicks classic Heartache and their spot-on rendition of the Knack's My Sharona, which even features the band's lead guitarist recreating his iconic solo, Note for Note. From their homes in California, Spaghetti and Frank, there's a name for you, called in to discuss their friendship, their collaboration, their musical tastes, and a lot more. Here's how it went. All right, guys. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for doing this. Pleasure to... Uh, I've never talked to you before, Frank. I've talked to you a couple of times over the centuries, Eddie, but uh, nice to talk to you guys today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, so you guys have known each other for over 20 years, right? Something like that. Since the 1900s. Since the, the old 1900s. Uh, is this just a music-based friendship, or do you guys, like, uh, I don't know, go bowling and fishing and, you know, do other regular folk stuff? Uh, no, we don't do a lot of regular guy stuff, but we would if we lived in the same town. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Or if we were regular people. <laughs> well, that, that would be the, the first impediment, yes, right. So we're not so, necessarily like real, I don't know about you, Eddie, I'm not necessarily, I don't, don't get me wrong, I've both fish and bold, but they're not something I'm doing on the regular with my pals necessarily. To be uh -huh. honest, I think that uh, I play music with most of my good friends, as I get it. See, I, I, I have a bowling that, ball. You do? <laughs> and is it used ball. for bowling? It is used for bowling. <laughs> okay. Wow. Uh, are, you a, are you a badass on the, uh, on the bowling court? I, I like to think I'm all right, you know. Uh -huh. I've got over 200 a few times. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. But I, I see, I because I, I kind of think the last thing you guys would want to do is hang out with other musicians. <laughs> That's where you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Most people can't stand uh, hanging out with musicians if they're not musicians because mm -hmm. musicians will go down these rabbit holes of like, you know, Eddie and I will talk a lot about like bands we loved and even covered on a record like the knack and kicks and and like but our girlfriends and wives are sitting next to us going like oh my god again with the kicks you know <laughs> yes hanoi rocks i know no one knows about them but you and all of your fucking friends yeah it's really <laughs> so, so so is this is this something that you guys have been itching to do for a long time or just an idea that came up recently out of the blue it sort of happened kind of spontaneously, uh, I don't know, serendipitously, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I had come back from being on a tour in Europe. We got shut down and I, I don't know, I got a hold of Frank for something. I can't remember why we were talking originally, but he was like, what do you got? You got any new songs? I'm like, yeah, I got one. I, I sent him a little voice memo over to him of this song. that was basically just me and an acoustic guitar in a hotel room. And uh, he he sent it back, and it was like this full band realized demo was all ready to go, like drums and guitars and keyboards, and I think there might have been horns or something on it, you know. And it just it was very well uh, thought out and and really well done. So uh, we just said that's kind of was the genesis of it. That was a song called "Shit's Fucked" that I had made up at the uh, beginning of the whole pandemic. Well, and the funny thing is, I think the pandemic kind of fueled a lot of aspects of this because the the thing that we first did at the beginning of this was this uh, benefit song called Flatten the Curve. That's what you were talking about, Eddie. It, it was us oh. and, a and a bunch of other musicians were all involved in this song right at the beginning of COVID when everyone was saying, stay home, stay home, flatten the curve. And that term is just getting into the public consciousness. Uh, Eddie and I and a bunch of folks, Josie Cotton, who actually runs the label, were on Kitten Robots. So that's also kind of how we cross paths with her. Um, but a bunch of musicians did this song encouraging people to stay home. And uh, Eddie recorded his parts at home and I recorded my parts and the original demo uh, for it uh, at home. 
And so I think that was kind of got me because I was already recording, but I was like, oh, I didn't know Eddie could record at home. That And he's in San Diego, so it's not impossible if we needed to get together for a session that we could. So I, that's when I was like, hey, what else you got? He sent me Shit's Fuck. And then at that point, we also did a cover of a Tom Petty song, the song Jammin' Me. And, uh, and the label that Eddie was with at the time, Acetate wanted to do a video and we did a video and it started to feel a little bit more like a project or something. And I remember we were on the video set and I was like, maybe we should just do a whole record. And Eddie was like, sure. And that was pretty much the beginning and end of any band meeting or discussion we really had about the whole thing. <laughs> at that point, we just started sending each other songs and basically a year later, we had a record. Now, these were these songs that you guys had had sitting around for a while that didn't fit in with with the band, or were they new things, or or what? Kind of both. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of both. One of these songs uh, is from the 1980s, mm -hmm. so uh, it's you know that that I had made up. So uh, it's a, uh, and then a couple of them were brand new that I just made up specifically for this project. So uh, and was there and a lot Frank of back had, and forth? Was there a lot of back and forth in terms of, you know, a song that, that one of you would get from the other, you would, you would go back and say, you know what, what if we did this or what if we did that? There was a, pretty much there stuff was stayed a, as it was. There was a couple that we did that on. The, the title track is probably the best example where I had, I had an idea for a song. I'd made a demo of that idea. It was pretty fully realized, but then Eddie came in and changed some lyrics and had some different ideas for the bridge and arrangement. And it kind of went through some changes uh, when he got a hold of it. Um, and then there's two covers. All for the record. better, of course. Yeah, of course, all for the better. <laughs> um, but I also think that, I mean, but, and then for the most part, they were just songs that Eddie brought in and then I would work on or songs that I brought in that he would work on. Um, and I don't know about you and your, it, with the su Super Suckers, Eddie, but with the Cheetahs, like, that's kind of how I work. I, I come in with songs. Like, I have songs. It doesn't mean I don't sit around and write with other people. I do that, too. But, like, for the most part, like, I have my own little studio, and I'm always coming up with ideas, and I make a demo, and I bring them to the band. And then once we play it live, it might go through some interpretation or, you know, some other ideas. But um, I think guys like Eddie and I, who are both songwriters in and out of our bands, like, we don't really come in with, like, loose ideas. We come in with ideas. Like, here's a song. Right. Right, you know. Yeah, I'm not gonna go. Hey, what do you think about this little lick? I got yeah, I'm, here? I'm not sure what to do with this. It's like, yeah, like that's cool, Ed, right? Yeah. And Eddie's not gonna be a kind of guy who's gonna write a cool riff and be like, "Geez, I don't know where to go with this." It's like, well, yeah, of course you know where to go with it. We've we've written a million songs. Like, this is what we do for a living. We write songs, you know. But, but right. you don't ever have to bite your tongue to go. Oh, you know what? But I have this really great idea for your song. Oh no, no I well, if, if I've got an idea for your if, for me it's not about whose idea it really was. Mm -hmm. Once I'm working on a song, I, I, I put all the facade of an ego aside, you know, it's just about making this song as good as it can be and and if, you know, if your idea doesn't make it, I'm, you know, don't be discouraged, just it just didn't make it this time, you know, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it's it, don't be too attached to the to the art. You know, Do you guys have different skill sets uh, in, in, in terms of writing or even in the studio that, that you found, you know, kind of streamlined the process in terms of, oh, well, you know, you take care of this and I take care of that? For sure. It was like Frank uh, can sing every note in the, in the sonic atmosphere, you know, so it's like you know, all the backups, I'm just like, just go nuts. Just do what it, you're going to do because it's going to sound great. And yeah, it's a real gift to have somebody who can sing that well uh, and to work with them. Well, and also I found when, when we got, there was a point with, with the songs where we, we got out of the home studio and we went into Kitten Robot Studios with our friend Paul Rossler, who's a great keyboard player. Uh, he didn't end up playing keyboards on it, but he's a very musical guy and he's got a great ear and he's a great engineer. And so we worked with him to kind of like redo a few things and get them up sonically. Uh, we also brought in uh, the Streetwalk and Cheetahs drummer, Mike Sessa, who's amazing and basically played the whole album down with live drums. But for me, what was cool is when we got to that point, that's kind of where like all of a sudden we were really in Eddie's comfort zone and he kind of stepped in a bit more and like kind of commandeered those sessions. And uh, that was cool because, that you know, there was I'd been working on some of those songs like in my home studio for like 10, 12 months 
which is to say like it was sort of nice at some point to like pass them off to eddie and paul for a few days and say hey you guys kind of run with it now because like i almost felt like with some of them i was like too close you know what i mean i just needed a little distance and it got to the point where when we hit the studio eddie got kind of jazz like oh shit now i'm hearing it with drums and all of a sudden boom like eddie was sort of producing for a few days and i was like cool <laughs> I'll just sit over here in the corner and drink a beer and you guys call me when you need me <laughs> yeah. well it sounds good i mean the songs don't sound uh like fussed over you know it, it's got a real punch and it's got a real immediacy it it, it sounds like it kind of came together pretty quick and easy and fast is that fair yeah well or? that's good that's that's what good rock and roll is supposed to sound like in, mm -hmm. in my opinion you know just something that it's 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 better to just think it's always been there like these songs have they never weren't around. They were always here. You know, that's yeah. the kind of feeling you want to hear when you, when I hear something that, that I really like. I'm like, wow, how is this new? How has this not ever been done before? This is, this is great. Do you ever have that, 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 that sort of McCartney moment where you write something and, and you go, wow, this is really good. I couldn't have written this. It must have been, I must have, you know, stolen it from somewhere. All the time. Yeah. I, I, anytime, like a lot of times a song will kind of come to me fully realized like I'll have the chorus and the verse and the bridge and it all just happens so fast. I'll be like, I'll, you know, after the 10 minutes I'm done writing it down, I'm like, wow, where did that come from? Mm. All, the, yeah. all the time, all the good oh. ones. You I agree. It? It's a, oh. Muting because my dog's barking. Uh, mm. I agree uh, just that it is weird how sometimes fully realized songs just come out of nowhere. And even as a songwriter that spends your time doing this and sort of having all these tools of the trade and all these like things, ways that you know to get to the end, sometimes they just come so quick. You're just like, whoa, where did that come from? Like, I don't even know, feel like I wrote it. It's just like, it was given to me. Uh, there was this writer I knew named Lon Friend and he used to say like, the ideas are always like up there in the ether sort of floating by like a river and like the job as a creative is to like reach up and just like scoop them down. You know what I mean? But like, they're always there. The songs are always, like Eddie said, the songs were there. We just needed to like figure out that we wrote these ones. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I like any... to keep my antenna up. Exactly. You know, just... was, there, was there any thought uh, given to trying to uh, avoid sort of things that, that sounded too much like your other bands? Were you sort of consciously trying to, you know, step outside your lanes as it were? Oh, I don't know if it was a conscious decision, but I'm always glad when I'm able to do something that, you know, the suckers, like the suckers don't have a piano. You know, we don't have a, a dedicated guy in the band who can play the keyboards and, and we don't have a horn guy. And, uh, you know, Frank is all these guys all in one person. So it's pretty great mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, to have that. But I, when I'm making up songs, I just, I try to make them up in my voice, you know, like I want people to know it's me behind it. You know, I, I want people to think of the super suckers when they hear me singing a song. I, that's, that's kind of the goal is to just all, all roads for me lead back to the super suckers, you know, <laughs> for better or for worse. I think one thing that maybe steered a little bit of the direction of this collection of songs um, was the covers actually, because yes. early on when we just sort of talked about it, and even before we'd actually did this record, we'd always like on the road and backstage and stuff would talk about like, hey, we should cover this obscure song or that, you know, we had sort of talked about doing like, you know, record some covers for an EP. We never really got it together, of course, but um, until now, it was like 20 years later, we finally pulled it together because of, of a worldwide pandemic. It took that to motivate us, but, um, but, Early on, I remember Eddie had always told me that my Sharona, he said it in many interviews, this is not new information if you're an Eddie Spaghetti fan, but that my Sharona is kind of like the perfect song. And a lot of people could tell you that's a solid argument, like that's a perfect rock pop song. And both of us are really big fans of uh, the band Kicks, and their first two records are very much in that sort of like power pop riffy kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and so we chose to do my Sharona, which felt like a sort of a ballsy move, but what the hell. And we chose to do a kick song, Heartache. And those songs have this very upbeat power poppy vibe that are maybe not quite the Super Suckers or the Cheetahs sound. So it seemed like when we committed to those two, that sort of steered the whole thing in the direction of like, well, there's obviously gonna be some rock, a little bit of country, but it's, it's sort of kind of got to fit in with my Sharona and Heartache. 
So in a way, I feel like the album, if, if anything, is a little more punchy power pop than either one of our bands tend to be too overtly, you know what yeah. I mean? Which is kind of oh, cool, definitely. just a little different for, for what we do in our sound. You know? Yeah, definitely that chunk surrounding the covers is it has a total 80s vibe. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the cool thing was that, because Eddie knows this dude who knew uh, Burton from The Knack, the lead guitar player, and we knew Brian from Kick, so we got the guitar players from those bands to play on our covers, which felt very, like, we're rock nerds, so that made us very happy. Yeah, well, the, the thing is, the first time I listened to the album, I went in cold, I didn't want to read the press release and sort of have stuff in my head, I just wanted to hear it like anybody else would. And so, you know, my Sharona pops up and I think, oh, well, is this going to be like, uh, you know, ironic or, or what? And no, it's not ironic in the slightest. It's completely straight. And then I go, oh, they're not doing like the, the, the radio edit. They're doing the full, you know, the full song. And oh, that solo is note for note. Jesus Christ, somebody put in some time on this. And then I read the thing and go, oh. <laughs> so, I mean, to me, that's kind of, I thought, A, it's ballsy, but also, I mean, it's kind of sweet, right? He probably hasn't played this song for a while. Yeah, I don't know what his uh, relationship with Marsh Rona is anymore, but he was super happy to do it. And it was, you know, a thrill to have him. So, yeah, that, that came out great. So what, what makes My Sharona the perfect song? I don't know. It's the song that I heard in 1900 and Booba da Boo. Whenever it came out, I was 29. 12, yeah. it was 12 years old or whatever when it came out, I believe. And it blew my mind. I, I was, you know, I was like a, I was kind of a, a, a rock fan up to then, you know, I listened to the radio and I, I liked, I had a couple records, but this was, for me, it was the, the band that I always wanted to be like, I don't know if you remember when they came out, they were like sinister. There was mm -hmm. like this dark story about them and the, there was supposed to be something evil about the record cover and, you know, everything about it was awesome back when, you know, you were able to have mystery involved in your uh, band and, you know, everybody did, wasn't looking at you 24 hours a day on the internet. And, uh, also, you know, it you was, know, it's a, got it was a beautiful great, time. It's got a great riff too. That riff is just unbelievable. You can't go wrong with the octave, like, like, you know what I mean? Like you could, you could, Th th that time frame in music that er you know 81 82 if you think about it there's like a whole batch of songs like whip it and you know valley girl my sharona that whole like dun -dun 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 -dun, or heartache by kicks like all these songs that had that sort of like power pop riff and my sharona is like the best of the bunch but i feel like that's like the era of those snappy little power pop riffs you know yeah, and and yeah. you're obviously a big fan of that too. I mean, uh, you know, I was just listening to the new uh, Cheetahs album, and and I mean, the first song to me is kind of like cheap trick right off the bat, you know? Right. Uh, well, yeah. I, I mean, I've always been a particularly a big cheap trick fan, but certainly, a, I mean, I like pop music. It's just that pop music now is not the kind of pop music that I like. But mm -hmm. uh, pop music from the '70s and '80s, and especially like hard driving guitar stuff, I love like early Elvis Costello and Cheap Trick, and you know. Um, there's lots of good music out there, but uh, I, even in punk rock and metal, I feel like it's always about the song and it's always about the chorus, you know? So even if your chorus is heavy, it still should be a catchy chorus, even if the context is Slayer or Motorhead. Like Motorhead writes really catchy songs. That's why people love them. Those songs are unbelievably catchy, despite the sonic presentation is, you know, pummeling and gnarly and blah 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 but like the songs are great little pop songs they're like chuck berry songs you know that's why they're such a great band the ramones wrote perfect pop songs those are rock songs but they're pop songs you know oh, exactly so did, did you guys learn anything from each other during this process did you pick up anything eddie learns that i sweat a lot <laughs> <laughs> I did. i learned that frank is extraordinarily sweaty <laughs> he's he's probably sweating right now and there's <laughs> no i'm in my i'm in my new place where i've got air conditioning and i'm calm and cool and collected and appropriate. <laughs> mm -hmm. nice it's All like right. what is it 61 degrees in your house or something yeah like oh my god in order for me to be comfortable it has to be like uncomfortably cold for everybody else oh, you need the meat locker do you <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. uh no i think what i mean for me like i said what i learned i think if anything was um well, for one thing, I never really made a whole record top to bottom that started on my computer. I'd, mm. I'd made elements, I'd made demos that I redid, or I'd sometimes would make demos and I'd keep like a guitar, this, that, you know, 
I had stuff that somehow emanated from that, but this whole record, until we hit the, the, the recording studio was really done with microphones and, you know, plugging stuff into my computer through GarageBand. So to have a, a whole album that started like that and then ended up becoming a big, huge rock record with all these huge elements to it and sounds, you know, in the sonic spectrum of our other band's records, uh, I was really happy with. And like I said, it was cool to see sort of watch Eddie get into producer mode. Cause that was, I've seen Eddie bass player guy and I've seen Eddie songwriter guy and I've seen husband, father, Eddie and hangout guy, Eddie, but I hadn't really seen producer Eddie and that was kind of cool. And, and, and so what happens when producer Eddie and bass player singer Eddie have a problem with each other? <laughs> oh, that's, that's luckily the, those days are pretty behind me, but it used to happen all the time, you know, when, because I would hear a, a part or something that I wasn't physically able to sing. It's mostly I'm frustrated with the singing. You know, I'm, I've become used to being a remedial bass player. That doesn't bother me anymore. But the, when I can't hit a melody or a note that I, I want to get on a song and I just, I, I have to just, you know, throw my hands up, do it, do it a different way and, and just give up the, the dream. But I haven't, now I realize what I can and can't do in my, I don't, I don't shoot for the stars anymore. I just, I go with what I can do. Well, also, I don't know about you, Eddie, but I have thing, a thing too, where like there's some songs that I can't, even songs that I've written, that I can't sing and play at all or well enough, and we just never play those ones live. You know what I mean? If I write a batch of 10 songs, probably six or seven of them, I can absolutely sing and play and have no problem executing my part. But there'll be a few where I'm just like, I can't. We can't, we can't do those songs, you guys, sorry. Like, it might be a great song, but like, if I'm the lead singer and I can't play and sing it, there's a problem. And therefore that's off the live. So I don't know, do you have any that you just can't pull off? Because for me with the guitar, it's like, the guitar kind of has to be in some rhythmic realm of what the vocals are doing. If it's completely and utterly opposite, push. it's hard for me to like do them both. It's, it's a lot of, you know this right i can do that time. i just can't do that uh, yeah it's a we have a couple that i don't i don't like to play and sing at the same time just the bass part's so busy or you know i don't like to have to always be looking down at my hands to and sing at the same time that's uncomfortable so yeah we just wind up not playing those songs but and you know most of the time ones that are complicated like that are not the best ones anyway so <laughs> nobody's nobody's losing out nobody's <laughs> clamoring for those yeah. right so was this was this easier than than you know making an album uh, with with your regular bands or just different? No, I wouldn't say it was easier. It was a lot of things about it were more difficult because uh, you know when I'm working with my band, I know exactly what's going to happen. You know, we we're, we're a machine in there now. And with with Frank, it was you know it was we didn't do it all at once like we normally would. You know, mm -hmm. it was piece together here a little bit there and just you know getting together was a challenge. So it was you know. And you know the pandemic was going on as well, so right. it was that, a little that more sort difficult. Of, did that sort of disjointed, uh, more disjointed approach actually maybe help in some ways to sort of give you more time to think about things? Yeah, but time can also be a, a bad thing. You know, if mm -hmm. you spend too much time on a song, especially, you tend to overdo it or overthink it. I'm, I'm, I like to think I've gotten pretty good at knowing when to stop adding stuff to a song and. You know, when, when that's the that's the danger when you're sitting on a project for too long is you just, oh, I got an idea, let's try this. And and you you forget that the song was great before you added all that stuff. All right. So yeah, you've got a double album all of a sudden. Luckily for yeah. Eddie, luckily for Eddie, overthinking is rarely a problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been accused wasn't of not sure thinking, where you were going with that. One. I've been accused of not <laughs> thinking things through, but rarely accused of thinking them through too much. <laughs> <laughs> So have you guys have you guys kept on uh, tossing songs back and forth? Is this kind of the start of of a, an extracurricular thing that's going to be a regular thing or what? I would I would imagine we would do more of this. We we haven't yet, but I'm, I'm I don't see it stopping. Right now is sort of a, a weird time, in the sense that like the suckers are just starting to go back on tour and kind of dipping their toe back in the water. And of course, up until now, virtually any time a tour has gotten booked for anyone, it gets postponed. Yeah. Uh, so I think if all goes well and you know, your, their tour goes well, these guys are going to go and hit the road to promote the last record. And I would think there'll be another Super Suckers record. Uh, the Cheetahs are just doing a bunch of dates now. So I think 
right now both of us are in this zone of like our bands have been on hold for so long that we're sort of like all right let's get some of that business done um but yeah i mean you know this is what we do we write songs you know i now that now that we realize we can do it together and and it's fun and easy and we can you know get a record de deal and put a record out like why not exactly well look that's about all i've got is there stuff we didn't talk about that you guys wanted to get to the record's out on October 12th, and it's called Motherfucking Rock and Roll. It's on Kitten Robot Records. You can pre-order it now. And the single, uh, I Think It Sucks and I Don't Like It, written by Mr. Eddie Spaghetti, is out now. And there's a music video coming out any day now. Well, I look forward to that. And, uh, you know, again, great job, guys. This was, uh, this was a... a a great album. I didn't know what to expect. Well, I kind of knew what to expect knowing, you know, both of your previous bands, but pleasant surprise. So well done. You just didn't expect it to be so motherfucking good. So motherfucking good. Exactly. I, I didn't know. expect it to be so motherfucking good either. I'm, I'm really, really happy with it. I, I actually listen to it still quite a bit. So. And I presume you get, you titled it. Well, Frank had the song and I said, well, that's obviously got to be the name of the record. So. <laughs> <laughs> A little collaborative there. A perfect, a perfect yeah. fit. That's generally right. the the way. I think one of the fun things uh, that we both found with working with each other is that we do very little discussing about how things should we should be done. We just kind of do things. You know what I mean? Like so yeah. stuff like that. Like I wrote a song. I said, "Hey, you like this?" He goes, "Yeah." Maybe that's the title of the record. And I go, "Yeah." End of discussion. Yeah. <laughs> you know like is that the secret to your there's a record called that with that song on it you know what i mean and there's not a lot of back and forth and you know i've got other bands where it's like we have band meetings and there's a, oh god i don't want to we have to talk about stuff can't we just do the things that we know we should do because this is what we do and i feel like with eddie and i he just you know it's like hey we should put out a record yeah i guess we'll need to get a record deal hey i know this label all right we got a record deal we should probably make a video come on over for the video write some you know just do do the things, and then they get done, and then we move on to the, the next thing. <laughs> just do the things. Just do the that's things, the, and shut up. That's the key to your the key to your success. No, <laughs> none of this talking shit. Just do yeah. it, get done, and move on. We, we yeah, communicate there, there, through the a music. Song right there, doing the things. I'm just doing the things. <laughs> I'm just doing the things. You know, here we go. There you go. That's how you do so, it. That, the do you ask, that is officially first song on the second uh, spaghetti and Frank. <laughs> doing, I doing the things. Thing. Also Perfect. a contender for the album title. There you go. Look at that. Hey, oh, you want to be me. in a band? <laughs> <laughs> we could be a three piece like, like you go. that. I play the drums. I'm ready to roll. So, Boom. all right. That's what we need. <laughs> all right. Well, listen, guys, thank, thanks a lot for your time today. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you somewhere down the road. Thanks, brother. See you, man. Take care. <laughs>